Thank you for tuning in. You are listening to Gnostic Studies. And today we're going to continue with our Hermetic Masonry series. <clears throat> we're on class 7. But before we jump into today's material, we're going to cover the previous class. And just put the link in the comments area if you're interested in looking at that. Um, but we're just going to review this handout. We reviewed the material for occult masonry that we talked about in classes one and two about the different degrees related with purification, illumination, and perfection. And talked about how this is also related with the interior work and the creation of the solar bodies, what are called solar bodies in uh, Gnosticism. Talked about Arcanum 9 and the descent into the ninth sphere. That we need to isolate ourselves, which is Arcanum 9, the hermit. We need to learn how to do that properly. And Eliphas Levy says, because uh, the card has a, the, there's a man, a bearded man with a staff and a, a cloak, which is said to be made of wool. And he says it's not enough to envelop oneself in a woolen fabric in order to isolate oneself from the astral light. One must also, and above all, have imposed absolute tranquility upon one's heart, upon one's mind and one's heart, as well as to have left the domain of passions behind and to be assured of perseverance in the spontaneous operations of an inflexible will, willpower. So we mentioned also the need to study Gnostic psychology and to practice meditation if we want to understand Arcanum 9. And we said that, quoting Samael and Beor, initiations are payments which the Logos makes to the human being when the disciple has sacrificed themselves for humanity. So we're not talking about pieces of paper that say that we're of X degree but there's something internal related with our um, the degree to which we've sacrificed ourselves for humanity. Then we talked about Arcanum 5, 6, 15, and 21. 5 is the Arcanum of the human being because of the, the arm, leg, leg, arm, head. Also the uh, hand has five fingers. But it's the five-pointed star, the pentagram, which can be upright or inverted, depending on which way it's pointed, and corresponds to the type of human being that we are. In tarot, it is the hierophant or the pope. And depending on how we use that star, how we use our, our uh, internal energy, Where, what type of priest or priestess, what type of pope or popus, what type of uh, hierophant we are. Um, we also said that if we use, if we look at Masonic symbolism, that they have a G often inside of a five pointed star, and that G is related to generation, that is, the generation of bodies, among other things, and those. That generation of bodies is the solar bodies in Gnostic esotericism. Alphas Levy says the number five is the number of good and evil, the number of the priest. Talked about that a little bit. But it just depends on which way we turn that star, right, in ourselves. So we have to choose the path, which is Arcanum 6, indecision, or sometimes it's called the lovers, 
in other languages the enamored, which we could understand as enchanted, that we become uh, enchanted by, by people because of love. Or that is because of the, the coagulation of the astral light. It's very important to understand what has happened and what where we find ourselves in the ray of creation. We're going to see in today's class what Samaelo and Veor says in regards to um, this. But what we want to remember is that the sexual impulse is neither good nor bad. It is the impulse to create. If we harness it, we can use it to our advantage. But if we become a victim of it, then we become uh, like, like an animal, like a beast who, who can't control themselves. And that's the path that we need to decide. What do we want to do? Who are we going to pick? We have to be careful of becoming enamored or enchanted because that implies that we're not necessarily uh, with it. We're not lucid. We're not conscious. We have to determine what we're going to crystallize, what we're going to create or generate. Arcanum 6 is the human being between vice and virtue. Sometimes it's also called temptation because... You can see there's a man standing here representing the initiate in the middle, and on the two sides there's there's different two different women that he chooses from. Alphonse Levy says that it is the uh, number of antagonism and of liberty. The number of radical negation and absolute liberty. So we could even say it's liberty and love. That is, we have to know how to liberate ourselves from this, these two polarities, right? Either being a victim of the, the impulse or learning how to control the impulse. We have to find a way through, pass through. can be the, the union between man and woman and then the decision that we have to make. And in that union, it is the union of two trinities, two triangles, which correspond to the three brains in the human being, intellectual, emotional, and action brains, or motor instinctive sexual centers, then when they unite together. So we have two trinities, man and woman, united. That's why Arcanum 6 is... How do we do it? You know, it, it means what, what are we going to do with that, with that union? Either we liberate ourselves through chastity or we enslave ourselves through passion. Passion is obviously the card number 15. And 1 plus 5 reduces to 6. 15 is reduced to 6. So that means there's a relationship there. The, uh, these two triangles related with Arcanum 6 can also be corresponding to the three traitors who assassinated the internal Christ. The Hiram Abif of the mysteries. So we have to choose between these two triangles. If we look at Arcanum 15, then we see that it represents the male goat of Mendez, Lucifer, Typhon Baphomet, the devil. It has many names. And uh, the mysteries of Baphomet, and Baphomet is, uh, do we have a picture? Uh, we don't have a picture. There's a picture on the web page. Uh, Baphomet is sort of a... a it's this thing, you could say. It's like a, a human-like figure with animal legs and a goat head. And what it means or what it symbolizes is what we are. We're a human-like figure, but the head, the thing that leads us, 
the way we act, the way we direct ourselves is animal until we learn to dominate that animal impulse, that fire. So here we see the two uh, little baby angels. They have little baby wings. They take, they're stealing the fire from the devil. The key to understanding Arcanum 15 is that we have to steal the fire from the devil. Which means white tantra, to connect and disconnect sexually without the spasm, without spilling the cup, without losing the energy. And that is how we can make the five-pointed star shine in an upright manner. Another way of talking about this is whitening the brass. So we'll talk more about that today. Then in the, the um, sort of addendum or, or second part, kind of uh, extra supplemental part of the class, we studied the astral light according to what M. Foss Levy told us. Very interesting information there. Uh, very helpful if we study it. So we're not going to go over it too much other than to say that there's the trident of Paracelsus and that in this trident, as Alphonse Levy broke it down for us, and this is the sort of explanation in a graphic, graphical manner, that there's three sides related with sheen, the, the letter of fire that we studied, Arcanum 21. There's the odd the, and the ob. They're like the yin and the yang, the fire and the water. And then in the center is Aur, the light. He says, one is liberty, the other is necessity. And in the center is reason, which he says is the universal law of nature, which is the essence itself of the verb. So, we recommend that you review the handouts or you review the material, the previous class. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail, but there's a lot of very helpful information if you're trying to understand this esoteric system that we call Gnosis. So we hope that that helps you. We're going to uh, jump into today's class now. Uh, we have a question. It says, what did Samael Owen Veor mean in the Yellow Book by saying that the powers of the jinn state are conquered by pranayama? Do you think that an hour-long asana and a pranayama is the training? Um, so the, the jinn state is related with the fourth dimension, so it's going to be related with yasad. And um, since Yasod is related with the creative energy, then certainly Pranayama is going to help with that. Uh, I, I've seen some videos f uh, of yogis from India, and they were saying that, you know, if you do Pranayama for 10 minutes, you get this, 20 minutes that, 45 minutes this, an hour that. So, yeah, an hour. Give it a try. Let's see what happens. All right. Today's class is a lecture. Lecture number 96 in a compilation called El Quinto Evangelio, the fifth gospel, which means 
because the fifth gospel is oral, is the oral teachings, the teachings that weren't written down, right? If we're talking about Christianity and the four gospels, the fifth gospel means the oral transmission, the oral teaching. It, uh, it wasn't given an official name, right? These were just lectures that were given and then somebody recorded them. And then later on, they were compiled together and transcribed. So the names that the transcribers gave were Lock the Devil Inside the Violin or The Gnostic Mystery of Lucifer. It's an interesting subject. The full um, translation of the lecture can be found in a book called The Gnostic and Esoteric Mysteries of Freemasonry, Lucifer, and the Great Work. So we're just going to read it, and you, if you have any questions, feel free. Part 1, the reflection of the Logos in us. The devil is certainly the philosopher's stone of the medieval alchemists. Undoubtedly, each person has their own devil. The devil, as it has been said, is no more than the reflection of the interior Logoi within each of us. That is obvious. He has power over the heavens, over earth, and over the infernos. When it is said, lock the devil in the violin, this intends to say that one has to grab, apprehend, capture that manifested verb, we could say, of the Christ Satan of the Gnostics. That verb which is proficient and is occupied, we could say, with the art of making musical instruments, and in this way give form to that verb in an instrument, so that it resonates miraculously. Thus we should make a clear differentiation between what the devil is and what Lucifer is. The devil in himself, as a reflection of the Logos in us and within ourselves, is the brute stone that must be carved until it is converted into the perfect cubic stone. And we have at the foot of that pair of columns the brute stone and the chiseled stone. What is there should be understood. Right, we know what those two columns are, that pair of columns, Jaquin and Boaz that we mentioned before. And we'll talk more about this in the Gnostic Astrology class. The brute stone, when it is not carved or hewn, the devil, or the reflection of the Logos in us, is unworked, unpolished. It is black as coal. It is Satan in his darkest and most tenebrous aspect but it is not an anthropomorphic Satan, like that which the clergy want us to see. No, it is our own, our very own, particular Satan. But when we have already achieved the dissolution of the ego, when we have reduced it to ashes, then that brute stone has been transformed into the perfect cubic stone. Then Satan is already Lucifer, the maker of light. In other times, Lucifer, the maker of light, was confused with Venus, the morning star. And even in the revelation of St. John, it is said that, To you who overcome, you will be given the star of the morning. Lord Quetzalcoatl, after having burned his inhuman elements in the infernal worlds, ascended to heaven and became the star of the morning in in Vespers, he became the bright evening star. Thus the devil is transformed into Lucifer, who is resplendent like the sun. He has the power over the heavens, over the earth, and over the infernos. Principle of the light, Lord of glory, the most grandiose archangel, the minister of the solar logos. If, in the suprasensible worlds, we invoke this reflection of the Logos of any person who has not dissolved the ego, then we will see a Satan, black as coal. 
But there, in the supersensible worlds, if we invoke, say, the Satan of someone who has dissolved the ego, we will see with great astonishment that we will be with an archangel of light, with a glorious Lucifer. Then we will see that such a Satan is the brute stone that must be carved. For the brethren to take a little more consciousness from what we are saying, let's have Mr. A arrange here between the two columns, the brute stone and the perfect cubic stone. There is a stone in the brute form, and here is, and there is the perfect cubic stone. There is the brute stone on the left and the cubic stone on the right. And somebody asks a question. In the brute stone that is there, and then the recording didn't uh, get the rest of it. The answer, correct. This Satan that each person carries inside in the individual who has not yet chiseled the philosopher's stone, their stone in the brute state is Satan who is as black as coal, displaying all the aspects of our psychological defects. But when we have carved the stone, then this Satan becomes the perfect cubic stone. That is to say, when we have dissolved the ego, it transforms itself into the perfect cubic stone, and the splendor and glory arise from there as a result. It is very interesting to observe the devil outside of the physical body. It is frightening to look at it, black as coal, with that tenebrous fire that tosses and turns in the individual who has not yet eliminated the ego. But on the other hand, it is surprising to see, in someone who has already eliminated the ego, a glorious archangel, full of splendor. But clearly, what is first necessary is to eliminate the inhuman elements that we carry inside. Part 2. The Three Triangles of the Self-Realized Human Being If we observe every authentic human being, then we will discover in them three triangles. Right. So let's understand why he's talking about these three triangles now. He just talked about a person who had eliminated their egos versus a person who had not. In the person who eliminates their ego, the aspect of themselves which we call the devil, when a person who has eliminated their ego, they don't have a devil, they have a Lucifer. That is, they have uh, an archangel of light. A person who has not eliminated their ego has a devil or a Satan. So, obviously we want to eliminate the ego. We, we don't want to have a devil inside. We want to have a, uh, uh, an archangel of light. So let's see what needs to be done. That's what he's going to talk about next. So we need to be a self-realized human being. He says, if we observe every authentic human being, he means a, a self-realized human being, then we will discover in them three triangles. The first is the logoic triangle. The second you could call the ethical triangle. And it is good for us to call the third the magic triangle. As for the first, the Logoic, it consists of three aspects of the Hebrew Kabbalah. Keter, who is the Ancient of Days, the goodness of goodnesses, the mercy of mercies, the occult of the occult. It is the mathematical point in the immense, infinite, unchangeable space. It is obvious that he unfolds in his turn into Chokmah, the Sun, the Cosmic Christ, who is said to be related to the whole Zodiac and so on. The further unfolding of Chokmah results in the Holy Spirit, Binah. Some Kabbalists emphasize the idea that Binah, the Holy Spirit, is female. This assertion, <clears throat> this assertion turns out to be mistaken. It is quite clearly said in the Divine Comedy that the Holy Spirit is the husband of the Divine Mother. And it is the Holy Spirit, the third Logos, Binah, that unfolds himself in his turn into his wife, 
into the Shakti of the Hindus. Thus, then, we must know how to understand this. Many who have the view that the Third Logos unfolds itself into the Divine Mother, into the Kundalini Shakti, who has many names, have believed that the Holy Spirit is feminine, and they were mistaken. Obviously, this archangel converts itself into the liberator. That is obvious, because of the fusion of the archangel with the human soul, with the spirit, with the being in a word. It turns out to be precisely the archangel. This is not in, written in any book of esotericism. There are many libraries, and nevertheless, this has not been discussed in detail, and everyone confuses the devil with Lucifer. And it turns out that the brute stone is one thing, and that the perfect cubic stone is another thing. Continuing then in tonight's discussion, we get a perfect account of that which marvelously exists in the depth of each one of us. He, the Holy Spirit, I repeat, is male, but he unfolds into her forming the first divine couple, the ineffable, the Elohim creator, the Kabir, or the Inca, the high priest, the Ruach Elohim, that, according to Moses, fashioned the waters at the beginning of the world. It is necessary that we, all of us, profoundly reflect on this so that we can comprehend all of this in depth. He and she are united in the cubic stone of Yesod. That stone is sex. Dath, perfect tantric knowledge, comes about from the union of him and her, through which we can integrally self-realize ourselves in all the levels of the being. Some of the Kabbalists suppose that the Sephira Dath, knowledge or wisdom, comes from the fusion or union of the masculine Chokmah, the cosmic Christ, with Binah, supposing that it is exclusively feminine. Such an assertion is absolutely false, because really, I repeat, the Holy Spirit is masculine, but the unfolding of Binah forms the perfect couple. When they join together sexually in the cubic stone of Yasod, in the ninth sphere, they become tantric knowledge, tantric initiation, the tantras through which it is possible to develop the serpent via the spinal column, the intimate self-realization of the being. In our studies of Kabbalah, we need to be practical. There are many authors, certainly some are wonderful, but when one reads of them, one realizes that they have not lived what they write. They have not experienced anything in themselves, and that is why they are mistaken. I consider that one should write what one has directly experienced for themselves, so I have done this for my part. Thus, the first triangle is transcendental, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are an indivisible unity, uni existing for itself. It is very much beyond the body, the affections, and the mind. It is the being, and the reason for the being to be is the being itself. The cubic stone of Yasod, located in the creative organs, is indeed that metallic soul which results from the sexual transmutations. We could call it the mercury of the secret philosophy, or, to talk in simpler language, creative energy. It, in itself, is allegorized or symbolized. It is personified, as, have I, as I have already said, in the devil. When we say that we have to work with the devil, we are not saying to lock him in a musical instrument. I'm sorry, we are saying not only to lock him in a musical instrument, but even more to transform him into a Lucifer, or a maker of light. 
we are talking clearly about how to work in the great work. It is interesting that there is there, precisely in the cubic stone of Yasod, where Shiva, Shakti, Osiris, and Isis will join sexually. And this is precisely where the Safirat Dat, tantric knowledge, is found, without which it is not possible to reach the intimate self-realization of the being. Part 3. The bones or bonds are radical. In Oriental Tibet, bone monks are radical, and this is why Helena Patronella Blavatsky thought that they were black magicians. All of us have repeated that mistake, and we feel the need to rectify it. Now, I'm not saying that the Dugpas are some saints or some kind of gentle sheep. They are black magicians. They teach black tantrism. But the bones, although they use a red cap, are not black, as Blavatsky mistakenly supposed. What they are is radical. If someone, for example, among the bones, does not want self-realization, but does want liberation for a time, to come back, for example, in the future sixth root race, or better, they never want self-realization, but emancipation without self-realization, then they succeed. How? First of all, they take the neophyte to a remote place. They invoke all those inhuman elements that the neophyte possesses through procedures of high magic. They will be drawn out of the astral world into the physical world. And in that remote place, in the mountain, those inhuman elements become visible, tangible, and everything. They try to devour the neophyte, but if the neophyte remains calm, there is no more to do. He, uh, he has emerged triumphant. He knows then that he has to eliminate the ego, reduce it to ashes, and also that he has to work. And the ordeal requires the maximum amount of effort in the physical world. This work consists of pronouncing those mantrams of disincarnation, which are two words, and one becomes disincarnated instantly. It is frightful to see the bone priests dressed with their white apron full of skulls and dead bones, a red turban on their head, a mitre, and carrying a dagger in their right hand. At the time that the neophyte then pronounces the two mantrams of fatality, his body instantly falls dead. But it is then that the neophyte is subjected to great ordeals in the internal worlds. He has to face the terrors of death. He has to withstand the hurricane of karma. He has to emerge victorious in the ordeal that the father-mother puts you through. You should know how to close the womb, etc. In the end, to be able to enter, or, to, or be reborn, we could say, in the superhuman form, in any of those kingdoms of the divas, already in the kingdom of the great concentration, or of the long hair, or the kingdom of Amitabha Buddha, or of Maitreya, or in the kingdom of supreme happiness, etc., it is in these regions where he is going to have to finish in order to prepare for liberation. The Divine Mother Kundalini assists in eliminating his inhuman elements, and in the end he is finally able to immerse himself in the midst of the great reality, not as a self-realized master, but as an elemental Buddha. There he submerges in that state, in order to return in the future sixth root race with the purpose of self-realization. Others simply do not want mastery, but emancipation, and remain forever converted into elemental buddhic ones and nothing more, but they are happy. Whereas those who seek liberation, those who really, we can say, need self-realization, those who really want to become Mahatmas or Hierophants are different. They will have to undergo Tantric initiation, and then they will have to work 
in the ninth sphere. But in general, they will teach you all about Tantrism. How to awaken the serpent, how to elevate it through the spinal column, how to open those chakras, discs, or magical wheels. Thus what happens is that the bones are radical. Someone either will self-realize or they will not self-realize. Either they are going to be released without self-realization or claim they are liberating themselves and that, and that they are self-realizing. Before them is something which defines a yes or a no. In them everything is violent. That is why Helena Petronilla Blavatsky judged them, considering them as black magicians. But when one studies the tantrism of the bones, one realizes that it is white, not black, but white, the transmutation of the seed into energy in order to achieve in-depth self-realization. Part 4. Yasod and Dath, Tantric Knowledge. It is therefore there, in the Sephirah of Yesod, where tantric knowledge is found, the Dath of the Hebraic Kabbalah. But brethren, let's move from the Logoic Triangle to the Triangle of the Sun. Right? Remember that the Triangle, the Logoic Triangle can also be called the Triangle of the Father. The Second Triangle, which is called the Ethical Triangle, can also be called the Triangle of the Sun, or the Triangle of the Christ. And the third triangle, the magical triangle, can also be called the triangle of the Holy Spirit. It is formed by this uh, triangle of the sun, the ethical triangle, is formed by chesed, that is the ineffable atman, the intimus, the inner being, by buddhi, the spiritual soul, which is feminine, and is the Geburah of the Hebraic Kabbalah, and finally by Tiferet, the human soul, the sun proper. It is interesting, and I may reveal what happened when I made contact with the work in the sphere of Tiferet. Obviously, I first went before passing through the exaltation into the Malkut of Venus, then into the Venusian kingdom of Klepoth, or better said, into the Venusian atomic world or Venusian atomic infernos. There are many inhuman elements there that had to be eliminated. Upon completion of the work, the one who is perfect, the cosmic Christ, entered into me, and I was transformed. I then saw the mothers who brought up their children, I blessed them and spoke to them with the gospel parable which says, Let the children come to me, because the kingdom of heaven is in them. That state is a state of static happiness. But in the end, of course, it is a march. I, as Tiferet, as the human soul, I comprehended what had been the objective of their manifestation. Yes, the cosmic Christ usually manifests himself through the human soul, by that Tiferet of the Hebrew Kabbalah. This is the Triangle of the Sun, a wonderful triangle formed by Atman Budhi Manas of Oriental Theosophy. But the gravitational center of the Triangle of the Sun is precisely Tiferet, the human soul, that soul that suffers, that cries, that groans, and that shouts for the truth. In practice, we have seen that the triangle of the sun with its gravitational center in Tifereth is a tremendous reality. Everything which is begun must sooner or later be anointed by the Father, by that Keter, Chokmah, and Binah, by that immortal Logoic triad which is indivisible and exists in itself. When I had to be anointed in those moments in which he poured pure oil upon me, he exclaimed, 
This is what I love most in the world. It is my most beloved son. Seek for him. And there came to my memory, in those moments, the case of the great Kabir Jesus, or Yeshua ben Pandir, as he was known in ancient times. Philip, the expert master in the Jinn states, told him, Show us the Father. And the great Kabir responded, The one who has seen the Son has seen the Father. The triangle of the Son, Chesed, Geburat, Tiferet, or the intimus with his two souls, divine and human, to be more clear, is, let's say, the unfolding of the Father, the manifestation of the Father. All right, part five, the magical triangle. So we've looked at the logoic triangle, the ethical triangle or triangle of the sun. Now we're going to look at the magical triangle or triangle of the Holy Spirit. Continuing then on the path of our study of the tree of life, we see something below that triangle of the sun in the magic triangle. And the triangle of the sun is also, I'm sorry, the triangle of the sun is also called the ethical triangle. Why? Because there we recognize the rigor of the law. There we come to know that which is good and evil, and to distinguish those things which are good from those which are evil, and the evil from the good, etc. The third triangle, the magic triangle, is very interesting, and it is composed of Netzach, or the mind, Hod, the astral body, and Yesod, the lingam sharira, or etheric body, or the basic sexual principle of universal life. Why is it called the magical triangle? Because it is undoubtedly in these kingdoms of the mind and of the astral, and we should also include the klipoth or the infernal worlds, where one has to exercise high magic. Something very important should be precisely illustrated here. We have all heard in occultism about witches' sabbaths, about worker bee and the witches. Some look at this as something strange, while others can smile a little. But the stark reality is certainly that those medieval witches' sabbaths, with the infamous midnight witches, have more realism than one may wish to think. Obviously, those hags, as they say in rigorous academic and Hispanic language, belong, let's say, to the world of Klipoth, the kingdom of Malkut, or the infernal worlds of the Kabbalistic Leviathan. Many quite strange things were seen in those Sabbaths, including that of Mary of Antinia, Antinia, Antina, Antina, so named in the ancient medieval convents, who was specifically their governor. Obviously, the witches of those ancient witches' sabbaths named her Saint Mary. And when I investigated in the world of Klipoth about this strange creature, how she shared her life with so many black magicians, how she could end up in so many witches' sabbaths, nonetheless, I never saw what we could call, what we could say, I never saw what we could call perversity. The tenebrous ones of the left-hand path, the sublunar creatures, rendered cult to her and considered her as a magus, a type of Hecate or proserpine, not as something tenebrous, but as a saint. I know what there was of truth in that claim of the alleged holiness of a creature that mingled with the darkness, that took part in so many witches' sabbaths and monasteries of the Middle Ages. Because who of those who has studied the old chronicles of high and low magic from medieval times has not heard of Mary of Antina? Antina. She figured in lots of short chronicles, which are today hidden between the dust of many libraries. Clearly, the matter was enigmatic. 
and I had to clarify it. And it was clarified when I was precisely in the world of Tiferet, in the second triangle, the triangle of the sun. I therefore invoked that entity, and she came, and I encountered her as a self-realized and perfect master with amazement. I then comprehended. She had emanated of herself from her bodhisattva, and this bodhisattva was educated in the exercise of magic in the inferior triangle or third triangle, passing through rigorous training and living within Klipoth, but without doing evil to anyone. Later I got in direct contact with her bodhisattva, with Mary of Antina, and when I invited the bodhisattva to visit the world of Nirvana, that bodhisattva pleasantly accepted my invitation, and when I fused with her real being, with the secret master, then I saw that it was the bodhisattva of a great adept, of a creature that had achieved perfection in high magic, and that while she lived in the world of Klipoth, she was completing her education or psychological training, exercising tremendous powers, and without doing harm to anyone. She was educated in high magic. When one observes that creature integrated with her real being, one realizes that she is an extraordinary white magician who knows both the kingdoms of the light as well as the world of Malkut, that is to say, the world of Klipoth. So that third triangle is that of practical magic. It takes a bit of work, but whosoever is on the path can understand how it works in the third triangle, because you have to stop all kinds of prejudices in order to work in that world of Klipoth. Natsach is the mind, Hod is the astral body, and Yesod undoubtedly is the night sphere. Then comes the kingdom of Malkut, which is the physical world, and that which is within the physical world, that is to say, that which is within the bowels of the earth, properly speaking, in Malkut, are the adverse Sephiroth, the Klipoth, the demons, as they say, the souls in sorrow, those who suffer, the lost, those who have already exhausted their cycle of existences and who are involuting in time, or the fallen angels, the genii of evil, etc. In those regions that exist within the kingdom of Klipoth, I saw undoubtedly those who develop themselves in high magic and who assist anyone to repent for their mistakes and who yearn for the light. Thus, when we study the tree of life, it is quite interesting to see, first, the wisdom of the eternal. Part 6. The Sephiroth and the work with the creative energy. Right, so he's gone through all three triangles. Now we're going to see some more information about the Sephiroth themselves. The Kabbalists adjust their distinct Sephiroth of the Hebraic Kabbalah to the different worlds. They say, for example, that the Ancient of Days is a point in the infinite space. Let's accept this as a symbol. That Chokmah is governed by the resplendent zodiac. And it is true that Binah is governed, they say, by Saturn. But there comes a point at which we have to descend. Not to say that the Holy Spirit is not ruled by Saturn and that there is no, re no relation of the Holy Spirit with Saturn. Yes, there is, but that is not all because there is no doubt that he is related to the world of Jupiter in certain ways because he has the power of the throne and also with Neptune as he is the edifier of the waters of life. There are those who say that Netzach or the mind is governed by Venus and that is all. The mind is governed by Mercury. But well, we are going through each Sephiroth in order to understand these things. Let's study the second triangle, because we have seen the first. Chesed, Chesed, 
they say is governed directly by Jupiter and nothing more. And that is false. Intimus is Martian, a warrior, a fighter. He has to fight for his own intimate self-realization. Does it have any Jupiterian influence? That is also certain, because it can wield the scepter of the kings. But to say that it is uniquely and exclusively Jupiterian, that is false. That Gebura, the rigor, the law, is exclusively Martian, is also a mistake, because Gebura is a Buddhic or intuitional world, the world of the spiritual soul, which is female. Here is the lion of the law. We do not deny it. It is solar, that is certain. But you know that the lion also has nobility. Here in Gebura we find the rigor of the law and we find the nobility of the lion. The world of the spiritual soul, the buddhic or intuitional world, is completely solar. The world of Tifaret, the world of the solar, I'm sorry, of the human soul, or the sun, properly speaking, undoubtedly is really governed not by the sun, as the Kabbalists claim, but by Venus. That is why the Christ was crucified on Good Friday. And this is something that we should meditate upon. With regard to the mind, to say that it is governed by Venus is false. We know well that the mind is Mercurian, that Mercury gives wisdom, and that Mercury gives the word, etc. The mind is then Mercurian, and if we descend a little more into the world of the Sephiroth, then we come to the astral. This is lunar. Some tribes, for example, in the very deep jungles in the Amazon, give their people or themselves use some special potions. Such potions are administered by the shaman. This, for example, is managed by what is called the yage, and combined with the guarumo. The shaman cooks the yage and the guarumo in a saucepan, and the neophyte drinks it when the moon is waxing. Then the astral unfolding is produced. Because they know very well the piaches or priest witches of these tribes that the astral is governed by the moon. That is obvious. But many Kabbalists suppose that it is governed by Mercury and they are mistaken. And with regard to the vital principle or the seed of organic life, with regard to the Sephirah Yesod, which is closely connected with the creative organs, it is obviously lunar, and we cannot deny it. In Gnostic esotericism, there appears the moon and a woman, an ineffable and divine virgin, dressed in a blue tunic that symbolizes the night, standing on the moon. You need to know how to understand this. The moon represents the sephirah yesod, that is to say, the sexual force. And in terms of the color of the robe, it represents the night in which the great mysteries of life and death develop. This signifies that one must work with the creative energy of the third logos only at night, never in the day. The work of the laboratorium oratorium of the Holy Spirit should only be in the nighttime hours. The Sahaja Maithuna, speaking in other terms, should only be practiced during the darkness of night, because the day, the sun, is the opposite of generation. That is clear. I have already explained this to you the other day, that if a hen with eggs is missing from her brood, for example, and the light of the sun shines on those eggs, then those eggs will be unable to hatch. And if she leaves some chick, it will die, because the sun is the enemy of generation. Whosoever wants to search for the light should ask the Logos, which is behind the sun that illuminates us. In the profound night, that is obvious. Part 7. Malkut, or the kingdom, and the fertilization of the creative waters.
As for the Sefira Malkut, which is the physical world, it is said to be a fallen Sefira. But the infernal worlds also belong to Malkut. That is clear. In these infernal worlds, we have to work for the emergence of life, separating the superior waters from the inferior waters, or the infernos of the Leviathan. In Genesis, it says, you have to separate the superior waters from the inferior. See the first chapter of Genesis, verses 6 through 7. What are those, quote, superior waters? The superior waters are the metallic soul of the sacred seed, that is to say, the mercury of the secret philosophy, which must be separated from the inferior waters. But how? Through the transmutation of the sexual energy. This is like separating the superior waters, or the soul of the seed, from the inferior waters of the same seed. And what for? For the emergence of life. Because of these superior waters, which are the mercury of the secret philosophy, and then the recording uh, was not able to be transcribed, with them one can create the superior existential bodies of the being. With them one can develop the child of gold. With them one can radically transform the human being. The superior waters, the mercury, is also allegorized with the figure of the devil. But we must transform the devil into Lucifer. This is the end of the talk for this evening, my dear brethren. If anyone has something to ask, you can do so with complete liberty. First question. Why do the Gnostic teachings indicate that only in the darkness can a new creature be engendered? Why do they indicate that only at night is it possible to create the superior existential bodies of the being? The answer. The crude reality is that, due to the disposition of the creative organs, such procreation is verified in darkness. Because when the zoo sperm goes out of the sexual glands, it is not illuminated by the light of the sun, but flows in darkness. In darkness, it passes through the fallopian tubes in order to encounter the ovum, which descends from the graphian follicle and is gestated within the darkness of the womb. What would happen if the zoo sperm, instead of exiting from the sexual glands protected by the darkness, could run under the light of the sun, if it could leave uncovered so that the sun could shower it with its light? What would happen if the fetus was not in the darkness, but it was uncovered in the belly of the mother, directly exposed to the light of the sun? It is obvious that failure would be a fact. So therefore, the fertilization is always realized in darkness through the disposition of the same creative organs. Likewise, the sage should also work in darkness, in the darkness and the august silence of thought, in order to one day reach the intimate self-realization of the being. The work in the night is indicated to us by that virgin of immaculate conception, standing still upon the moon and dressed in a blue tunic. Part 8. Understanding Lucifer Master, being that Satan is the reflection of God, and therefore being that Satan is love, would it not be inconsistent to say that the ego is satanic? Answer. Remember that there exist two types of darkness. The first is called the darkness of silence and the darkness of the august secret of the sages. The second we can call the darkness of ignorance and of error. Obviously, the first is the super darkness. Indubitably, the second is the infra darkness. This means that the shadows bipolarize themselves and that the negative is only the unfolding of the positive. By simple logical deduction, I invite you to comprehend that Prometheus Lucifer, chained to the hard rock, sacrifices himself for us and is subjected to all the torture, even the one who is faithful to the scale, the giver of the light, the guardian of the seven mansions, 
which does not pass, but those who have been anointed by wisdom, who carry the lamp of Hermes in their right hand, inevitably unfold themselves into a fatal aspect of egoic multiplicity, into those sinister psychic aggregates which compose our I, and which have been duly studied by esoteric tantric Buddhism. With this explanation, gentlemen, I believe you have understood my words. Can we use the clavicle of Solomon exclusively to invoke dangerous entities, or can it also be used to invoke the divine entities? Answer. One can invoke the angels and the holy gods with the clavicle of Solomon. In the Middle Ages, the clavicles were used, then, in order to invoke Lucifer. Of course, you need to have a lot of valor to make that kind, that type of invocation. It is very dangerous because the individual still does not have the structure of an adept, of a magician. And before a question of this kind, what happened to this good friend of mine may also happen to you. She died three days afterwards. So now he's going to give us a story. And it is not out of scope in these moments if I go back to what I remember happened in Costa Rica. The case of the woman whore who lived in a state of inebriation, going from bar to bar. And although it is a little grotesque to repeat her words, for the sake of the great cause, I will comply in repeating them. She said, I daily, forgive my expression, I sleep with so many men, 14, 15, sometimes even 20. And she said, and if the devil appeared to me in person, I am refining her words, I am not totally quoting her words so as to avoid being too vulgar, then I would also sleep with him. Right. So if the devil appeared to me in person, then I would also sleep with him. Well, recounting, similar to how the locals know everyone in the world in a village of Costa Rica, certainly one of those days, one of those days, one day of those many days, an apparent sailor came to visit this woman, which of course required affection, and he also slept with her. After a while, that woman then, having realized the sexual act with the sailor in question, sat down at the threshold of the door of her horrible apartment. Sitting there watching the landscape, the panorama, and the people who came and went, etc., suddenly she felt someone was calling. It was the sailor. He said to her, You do not know me. You think that you know me because you slept with me, but you're wrong. You do not know me. You should look inward to know me. Then she turned to look, and what did she see? Lucifer was converted into a true devil, terrible, as depicted as he is depicted in mythology out there, with all his cavernous horrors. The woman fell down instantly, fainting, and three days later she died in the hospital. Those who witnessed that apartment said that a smell of sulfur was coming out of it. For a time, people did not want to pass by that street. Of course, before she died, she told her story. It was enough to tell someone, but she could not resist. She died. What happened? Well, her very Lucifer, who was so horrible, clearly intervened for her own good. Possibly. I am not saying possibly, but rather that it is obvious. He was sent by the Ancient of Days, by her own father, who is in secret. And he actualized or materialized himself physically. Clearly, the lesson for the woman was terrible. She disincarnated. We can be sure that when that woman retakes a body, when she returns she will never again fall into prostitution. Now it is possible for her to follow the path of chastity because the, le the lesson that she received was very bitter. That is, her father, who is in secret, solved this problem by carrying out a surgical operation. Yes, the elegance of the situation is worthy of that part of the being called Lucifer. And as a result, much later on, this woman can even walk the path. 
So you see he's giving us more and more explanations related with Lucifer. So let's see, we got a statement here. If Malkut includes Klipoth, then how do we distinguish where the 48 laws are applied? I, under, I understood that Klipoth began under 96 laws and doubles at each level. Right. Um, so he's just saying that that um, in his way of breaking it down, which is top down from uh, Keter down to Malkut, that since Malkut is a fallen Sephiroth, because it is fallen because we fell from Yesod, right? We fell in Yesod, we could say. That Klipoth are also fallen Sephiroth. They're sort of the unfolding of that fall. But you're right, Klipoth do have 96 and, and plus, you know, and more inside of there, according to the, the Gnostic teachings, and that Malkut has 48. So, but Malkut is the physical world, right? The physical world that we're talking to you right now through. But uh, Klipoth is, is the interior of the earth, we could say, or the interior of the human being. So it's, it's further within. So it's within Malkut. All right, let's keep going, see if we can get through this thing. I didn't know if we'd be able to get through it. It's a lot, but uh, hopefully you guys are getting some benefit out of it. The most important thing is is uh, coming up, in my opinion, right? There's a lot of very useful information. Part 9, whitening the brass, creation, the error of Sakaki, and the El I Elohim. So then there's a bunch of questions and answers back and forth here. So, Venerable Master, and then in order to whiten our Lucifer, what do we do? Destroy the ego. Reduce it to cosmic dust. It is necessary to be dressed in white. Furthermore, it is necessary to dress with the purple of the kings. We must feel pity for our own Lucifer. And if he sometimes... And then, you know, inaudible, we can't hear what he said. The answer, he gives the sexual impulse to the whole world. What is critical to know is how to make use of this impulse. But how? Thrusting the lance into his side. You remember that Lucifer is the staircase to descend. And remember that Lucifer is the staircase to ascend. Read the Divine Comedy. And in it, you will find ample illustration of Lucifer in the ninth sphere. Master, how is it that you say that Krishnamurti has absolutely no ego, when in reality, after the second mountain, the Master still has to continue executing the work in order to achieve perfection? And is this because before achieving resurrection, one has to work in the infernos of different planets, disintegrating, let's say, the germs of the ego? Yes, Krishnamurti, the Lord Krishnamurti, is a very ancient soul. But really, despite the fact that he does not have, we could say, what is called ego, therefore, he has not achieved the resurrection, because he lacks something. Obviously, one must descend to the ninth sphere to work. Clearly, something must be eliminated, which he is unacquainted with. But if we say he has no ego that he is clean of ego, that is, in what is only humanly understandable. Because beyond, there, is, there are still certain elements that escape, we can say, the comprehension of everyone, and we have to disintegrate those as well. Venerable Master, returning to Genesis, regarding a question that was previously asked, which is to say that after the separation of the sexes, not all fell, and that those great masters who have not fallen since their exaltation continue on their path. But has every master in a past Mahamanvantara necessarily descended, or have they necessarily always been produced from the paradisiacal fall? 
Well, there is a fall in Genesis, and there is one in the revolt of the angels. Nonetheless, we must distinguish that which is a fall from that which is a descent. Many confuse a fall with a descent, and in both cases the initiate goes down to the infernal worlds, to the ninth Dante-esque circle, to work with the fire and the water, origin of worlds, beasts, men, and gods. Then this lends itself, we could say, to many interpretations. But we must never confuse a fall with a descent, a descent. They are different, and falls and descents always appear in every genesis. I mean the error, shall we say, of Sakaki, which is always processing itself. Well, the error of Sakaki is not processed in all the cases. The Archangel Sakaki was mistaken here, in this solar system, or on this planet Earth. But that is a case for a new paragraph. Yes, Master, I mean that referring to Sakaki, not referring myself to that same drama. Maybe it was not Sakaki, it was another one who perpetually produced the fall. In every universe which is born, there are falls and there are descents. The Elohim must go down, but sometimes they fall. But in any case, they need to descend to amplify themselves, to descend in order to later be able to ascend and to arise victoriously. That is to say, all descent is, all ascent is preceded by a descent. All exaltation is preceded by a frightful and terrible humiliation. If not, then where would the merit be? Master, when a master submerges themselves into the absolute sun, do they convert themselves into a I Elohim? Well, I do not think that it is possible to be turned into an Elohim in the absolute. An A Elohim. An, a, an Elohim, in order to be able to submerge itself into the absolute, first has to convert itself into an Elohim, and afterwards it has to submerge itself. First one is converted into an I Elohim? What did you say? No, this is the question <laughs> I am asking. What is it that converts itself into an I Elohim? I Elohim is, El is I Elohim. Elohim is Elohim. I Elohim is the eternal, common, cosmic Father, the infinitude that sustains everything, the omni-merciful, the ineffable absolute. And Elohim is the second unity, the manifested unity, the host of the Elohim creators, the host of the androgynous ones who created the universe, etc. That is to say, the army of the word, the army of the voice, the verb, Indubitably, the Elohim that submerge themselves into the bosom of the Eternal Cosmic Father, into the Absolute, receive their true name, which is that of Paramartha Satya. A Paramartha Satya is something ineffable, something impossible to comprehend at a simple glance. The Paramartha Satya is beyond good and evil. It is far beyond the personality and far beyond individuality and the I. The Paramartha Satya is transparent like a crystal. It is terribly divine. Very few are those who manage to become Paramartha Satyas. Master, returning to Lucifer, since one has to whiten Lucifer, right? I mean, one has to turn him brilliant white, right? Into brass, then? He himself can collaborate with us so that we can convert him into a, that exalted Lucifer? Here is, in my opinion, the important part to understand, the most important part. He collaborates with the temptation, because if not, in what other way could he collaborate? Temptation is fire, but triumph over temptation is light. If one overcomes the temptation, then one overcomes Lucifer. When overcoming him, upon the same body of Lucifer, 
on his back, one triumphs, and then one is raised up. Remember he said before that uh, the stairs. He says, you remember that in the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri, Virgil goes down on the ribs of the Lord Lucifer and also goes up on the ribs of the Lord Lucifer. Lucifer is the stairs to descend. Lucifer is the stairs to ascend. If we overcome temptation, we ascend on the very same back of Lucifer. He puts temptation in front of us so that we can ascend. Now you can see Christ disguised as Lucifer. How grandiose is Christus Lucifer? How grandiose putting the stairs for us so that we can rise up. Right? Because we know Lucifer gives us the sexual impulse. He mentioned that earlier. And Lucer, Lucifer collaborates with the temptation. So when we learn how to overcome the temptation, which means sexual temptation, but there's other temptations as well, then we can uh, raise ourselves up, climb up. But we must not shun those tests, those ordeals that are being given to us. Because those tests or how we earn, how we prove, how we show that we uh, can overcome temptation. Part 10. Comments on Krishnamurti, Lucifer, the Divine Diamond, and the Heir of Sakaki, and the Guide Dog. So now we're going to start putting the pieces together even more. Venerable Master, you said that Krishnamurti has aged, but when the phoenix bird rose from the ashes, Krishnamurti mounted him and elevated himself. I did not say anything like that. <laughs> I said that Krishnamurti is lacking something, and that is all. What is he lacking? Only he knows what he lacks. I said that he lacks the descent into the infernal worlds. Well, that is my concept of his situation. Others can think differently. Master, in reading the book of Krishnamurti, the Bhagavad Gita, one can see that it is very deep, but does not descent, but does not the descent into the, but does not mention the descent into the infernos. And speaking with some of his adepts, one sees that they do not work with the third logos, because they are simply abstinent and they say that they use sex solely to procreate. That is to say, that if they have his teaching, then this means that he does not work in that aspect. The work of the Bhagavad Gita is a very wise work. It has two sides, the public and the secret, because in the secret side, we can see perfectly that all of the esoteric work is defined, because we encounter Arjuna, under the direction of one's internal god, Krishna, fighting terribly on the battlefield against their relatives with the lance in hand. This is none other than the fight against the inhuman psychic aggregates, which you, we all carry in our interior. So when the lance and everything is spoken of, we must know how to understand it. Krishna, indubitably, was a great avatar. What did you say? Venerable Master, we should establish a differentiation between Krishna and Krishnamurti, that they are two different things, right? Yes, because we are speaking, she asked for Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, right? There's no answer or inaudible answer. Krishnamurti is another thing, right? We know well that Mr. Krishnamurti lives at the moment in Ohio, the United States, right? So then to whom are you referring? Well, Master, sincerely, I was referring to, to that which the Master was mentioning, the one that wrote the Bhagavad Gita. The one who wrote the Bhagavad Gita is one thing, that is Krishna, and Krishnamurti is another thing, which is for a new paragraph. Master, why is it a crime to throw away the philosopher's stone more than seven times? Well, it is because the Christus is already exposed to too much suffering, in such a way that it is possible to fall under a curse. Let's see, brother. Venerable Master, when I have worked with Lucifer, with the divine daimon, to leave in the astral body or in jinn, and especially to know my bestial entities in the different levels of the subconscious mind, 
I have been with a terrible brother. But must I overcome him or be friends with the terrible brother? The answer. Well, you must overcome him if you want to overcome. But remember that everything is symbolic. Remember that what interests us is, practically speaking, the death of the myself, of the oneself, the death of the ego. While a man does not pass through the death of the ego, while he is not beheaded, then obviously he marches on the path of error. This is why the Lord Lucifer interests us, because he serves as stairs for us to ascend. And that is all. And it is from this most interesting and important point of view that we must see him. And that is why in this cathedra, which especially interests us, I am referring to this cathedra specifically. The death of the animal ego is fundamental. Let's see, brother. Venerable Master, returning to Genesis and the archangel Sakaki, okay? As, and as the Bible says that man was only producing a drama, this, the question would be the following. If there exists the Luciferic power, power, then what reason was there to give to humanity the Kundartiguador organ? That was necessary at some epoch, but there were errors in calculation, which is another thing. Obviously, each organic machine captures certain types and subtypes of cosmic energy, which, is, which it soon transforms and retransmits to the following layers of the planetary organism in which we live. Since you asked about what happened in those Lemurian times, then we will explain. The Earth did not have stability. The geological crust shook. There were incessant earthquakes. So the Kundartiguador organ, sometimes it's called a Kundibuffer organ, was considered necessary. Then what happened was that this machine, mistakenly called man, which served to transform energies, then should readapt, and he was given the abominable Kundartiguador organ. The result of this was magnificent. The stabilization of the geological crust was established, but there was a miscalculation by the angel, by the great angel Sakaki because he failed in transfinite mathematics, in transfinite numbers. That miscalculation caused humanity to have the Kundartiguador organ much longer than a certain normal time. That is to say, it was the hand of the archangel Sakaki which specifically caused this, and the result was that when the abominable Kundartiguador organ disappeared due to the intervention of the common archie physical, chemical, seraphim, angel, Luisos, the evil consequences of the abominable Cornartiguador organ were already in the human organism. Those evil consequences are the cruel psychic aggregates that we all carry in our interior. I am referring in an emphatic form to the eyes, the egos that personify our defects. What did you say, brother? Can we establish that Lucifer is the docile sexual impulse, the guide dog? Yes, let's see it from that point of view. In the end, Lucifer is the reflection of the Logos in us, who gives that impulse. If we manage to thrust the lance into Lucifer, dominating the sexual impulse, then we rise degree by degree with the same body of the Lord Lucifer as did Virgil and Dante. For that reason, it is said to you, in humorous form, that if we truly want to arrive at intimate self-realization of the being, we needed to have the devil as a godparent. Right? Remember, in humorous form. Venerable Master, I mean that to really polish the mandate of Rome is to whiten the brass? Well, the brass does not whiten if the sacrament of the Church of Rome is not refined. If the sacrament of the Church of Rome is refined, it whitens the brass, on condition that one work on the psychic aggregates which we carry in our interior in order to destroy them with the lance of Longinus. Master, we know that, that we know what a master is. We can declare him then the king of nature, and that the elements, for example, like the gnomes and the pygmies of the earth, Obey the master. 
They also do so in trying to fix those problems that exist in the layers of the earth, so that it was not possible for that to be done by means of orders from the ineffable masters. We could say, by ordering the gnomes and pygmies to execute that work. Well, the masters are not empirical. They work with the very same laws of nature. They imitate nature, and with nature they transform nature. This is stipulated by Sendivogius, the great medieval alchemist. So it is indubitable that laws cannot be broken. It is necessary to use the same laws so as to be able to organize nature. I mean, that would have been almost like a leap, thus what would have been, what would have given to nature. What you are saying would be empirical. It is necessary to work in agreement with the rules, according to the art. Nature transforms into nature and obeys the very same nature. The alchemist must know how to imitate nature if they want to triumph. For example, if someone wants to create the superior existential bodies of the being, if they want... They will have to work at night, in the night sphere, not in the day. Why? Because in the day, the solar rays are active, and they are detrimental for all generation. Put down a chicken egg, for example, in the light of the sun, to see if the hen hatches, to see if they leave, if the chick leaves its shell. But the nest of the hen is placed in darkness, and she will leave the chicks there. It is always necessary to work with the very same rules of the very same nature, not in an empirical way. Everything has its science, and the masters must act in accordance with the rules of the science, according to the art. Master, it is true that Lucifer can be used to make pact or is it true that Lucifer can be used to make pacts to secure money? My father, when I was small, told me that one day he had gone to a mountain. He had taken a cat and that he threw it alive into in he threw it alive in order to boil it in a copper container, and that soon he had to leave with that water. Then he had to go up a path and hand it over with a feather in his mouth, and there Lucifer appeared to him. He was supposed to release the feather to Lucifer, and then Lucifer said to him that he could Ask him for what he wanted, and my father then wanted to request for wealth from him. So, can Lucifer be used for those things? Clearly, my father did not reach completion because he was scared. Well, the reality is that those operations of those are operations of black magic. What the people do is invoke demons. Lucifer is not for those things. He is the reflection of the Logos. The same Christ within us, Christus Lucifer, is sacred. When he provides us with a lot of temptation, it is for our own good. This looks like the last section. Lucifer and the Luciferian Impulse Excuse me. Yes, brother? How can we differentiate the sensual eye from the Luciferian Impulse? From what? from the Luciferian impulse, from Lucifer? Well, by awakening the consciousness. The sleeping ones do not know of these things. The sleeping one sleeps with this. The sleeping one sleeps with this. And they get the wrong end of the stick. One in a million times. That is clear. Let's see, brother. We return again to the question of consciousness. This small group still not, is still not wide awake. And then the master must be sufficiently comprehensive so as to empower the class. Because if one converts oneself into a character, we could say into a reactionary character, into a hard character, first of all, naturally one would not be capable of giving the class. It is necessary to have, we could say, comprehension with the students, since all do not comprehend the totality and it is necessary to try to descend to their level so that they can understand. Understood, Master. Let's see. Master, it is said that Lucifer is the stairs to go up and to go down. Then what would become of us if he did not exist? 
then our existence itself would be inconceivable, as well as the existence of that person. If Lucifer did not exist, you would not exist. Since you exist, you need a sexual impulse. Surging, which caused the father and the mother who brought you into the world to create your physical body that you actually have now. In this way, if Lucifer did not exist, you would not exist, nor would anything exist which is present here, that is, the crude reality of facts. But Lucifer is not a separate individual, like that devil who puts those remedies there with an enormous trident and who governs the universe. No. Lucifer is the reflection of the Logos within ourselves. Everyone has their own Lucifer. I believe the Cathedra then has already concluded. We're going to give some treatments, but do not leave me with a heap of treatments because we cannot catch up with the time. A baby that was going to be brought to me, a sister that... It is good I have spoken of a psychic subject. It is good that this is like an exception because the third chamber, in third chamber, one does not make those. The baby, bring it. So that's the end of the transcription we have of that uh, class and then the questions and answers going back and forth. Um, that's what we wanted to present. Thank you for hanging in there. That was a lot of reading. Looks like an hour and a half. Uh, we've been online, so we want to open it up for questions or comments, if you have any. Oh, someone says they're looking for they look forward to the lectures. You're welcome. Happy to present the material. Obviously, it has helped us tremendously. That's why we're sharing it, I'm hoping that it can help others. And even reading it this time, maybe this is the sixth time I've read it, maybe more. But uh, I see more things. That's that's the way this author writes. It's um, very special. Get more and more and more. We got a question. New to the channel, you talk much on egregores. No, not really. We don't talk about that. We're talking about... Self-realization, um, trying to understand why we exist in a physical form on this planet at this time and what we need to do to change our situation, understanding the law of compensation so that we can um, take advantage of the opportunity that we have, which is to take advantage of the creative energy, to learn how to dominate the animal impulse we have within so that we can Return to divinity, connect with God, which is something that each human being can do for themselves when they learn how to work with the laws of nature that we mentioned a little bit about today. Well, um, let me, while well, we're, I know there's some lag, so I'm going to talk a little bit more just for a couple of moments to see if you guys have any more questions but let me just invite you to next week next week we'll be doing same time right uh we'll be studying another lecture which is called the magnus opus or the great work and uh you know just like today's class talked about kabbalah but it also talked about understanding what lucifer is related with his sexual impulse related with the reflection of divinity within us the reflection of the Logos is the impulse. So when we learn how to use that, then we can uh, mirror divinity. If that makes sense, so that we can reconnect. When we learn how to create the way divinity creates, then we can um, create our interior universe. So that's the goal. That's the, the path, the plan. And part of that is eliminating the inferior or uh in, in inferior waters right the uh, the ego the that the desires psychic aggregates whatever we call them um, but but anyway we'll talk more about that and the reason we mentioned arcanum 15 was because if we study 
Arcanum 15, we studied a little bit in the previous class. Uh, it talks to us about this Baphomet character, this Typhon Baphomet or Lucifer Baphomet, this uh, symbolism of what we are, this animal thing that we are, that we need to convert ourselves into a real human being, not, a, not an intellectual animal, as it's sometimes called. So next week we'll, we'll do another lecture, and then uh, the week after that will be the conclusion, summary and conclusion, and then after that we'll, we're jumping right into it with uh, be the spring equinox, and we're going to start that astrology. So we want to invite you guys to all those classes. Um, dom okay, we got some questions here. Dominate the impulse or let it go? Dominate the impulse. Yes, is, is they say uh, nature of Lucifer seems interesting. It is interesting. It is interesting to understand instead of just to say, you know, like why does the devil exist, right? Why does this thing, why does Lucifer exist? Why do these things exist? Now we can understand. With this explanation, we can understand why temptation exists it's so that we can test ourselves, so that we can better ourselves. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it and look forward to talking to you again soon. If you have any questions or comments in the meantime, please leave them in the comments or you can always email us, gnosticstudies at gmail. And until next time, we wish you the best in your internal work.